Back for another edition of In the Huddle, Carl Dukes. Put him up, along with my man Brian Baldinger, Jason Lock on four, a part of this podcast as well. And Baldy, first of all, uh, OTAs. We talked about it last week. A lot of people responding to us saying, hey, it is important, and I want to see what guys are going to do and how they learn, and coaches talking to us about it. And you happen to have a chance to go down to Miami this week. Want to start there because there's a lot of conversation about this division, right? We're talking about the Bills and the Patriots. And obviously, uh, you know, the Jets, which everybody's talking about. But Miami, they're interesting. They're talented. There's a lot there. And and it all starts right with Tua, which we'll get to. But talk a little bit about your experience down there with the Dolphins this week. Yeah, that was good, Carl. Uh, They've got OTAs this week, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, They had a good day yesterday. It was raining early. They were indoors, kind of warming up. They came out. They had a good session. I mean, a lot of individual drills, a lot of balls in the air. All the stars were there. Tyreek's running. Jalen Waddle's running. Jalen Phillips is out there. You know, Bradley Chubb, Jalen Ramsey. I mean, they're all there. So, um, you know, but the big thing to me in Miami is, you know, Tua did finish as the number one rated quarterback in the NFL a year ago. Highest quarterback rating in the league. Won a lot of games. Obviously, the health is a priority in importance. He seemed fine out there, but the big, you know, the big, re- the, one of the big reasons why I think OTAs are important for Miami is Vic Fangio is the new defensive coordinator, mm. you know, and Mike McDaniel's known Vic, you know, was, uh, for a long, long time, coach mm-hmm. against him, coach with them. There's a relationship there. And I've known Vic a long time going back to the dome patrol in new Orleans and what he did there. Um, but you know, they, They've added some pieces, obviously, Jalen Ramsey opposite Xavier Howard. Um, and there's a lot to learn. I mean, it's it's it it looks kind of simple. It's kind of taught in a way that feels kind of simple, but there's a lot there. And so every rep, I'm just watching Jalen Ramsey yesterday, just through a lot of walkthrough type situations. Like he's he's dialed in. It's not like he's out there. Um, playing catch on the sideline and they're doing a drill. Like he's, he's dialed in because ultimately you want to get to training camp, Carl. And this is not just the Dolphins. This is every team. You want to be mentally playing fast. You don't want to have to be thinking. Jalen Ramsey's played this game. He's been on the number one defensive football, won a Super Bowl. He's been on the number two defensive football, went to a championship game in Jacksonville. He wants to be a top five off uh, defense and they have a chance. They're very, they don't have a weakness on their defense. And they got uh, an elite defensive coordinator. And so, um, and, and Vic caters his defense to his, uh, to his talent. So they've got a young kid in Jalen Phillips going into his third year. I think he's going to be a superstar in this league, Carl. Like, I mm-hmm. think he's got, in fact, I'll tell you a story. Yesterday in attendance was, uh, uh, was the former general manager of the Minnesota Vikings, Rick Spielman. Okay. So Rick was there yesterday and he's worked for CBS sports now. So I asked him about, you know, when, if he worked out Jalen Phillips, when he was a GM and he goes, Oh, I, I worked him out. I'm going to tell you this Baldy. This is not just hyperbole. He goes, he had the single greatest workout of any player I ever worked out mm-hmm. at any position. Like he came out with some other guys. He didn't think anybody was close to Jalen Phillips. Uh, he's had Daniel you know, Hunter, who's got a 70 plus sacks in six years in Minnesota. Like he's got, he's had some elite guys. This guy is like, he's all of that. His movement is elite. His size his strength. Like he's ready to break out. You got Bradley Chubb, Jalen. I mean, they're Christian Wilkins. Like they could be very, very good on that side of the ball. And it, and, you know, to watch Vic coach him up, like he looks, you know, I mean, He's been a head coach and didn't really work out great, but he looks rejuvenated. He looks like he's ready for this assignment. Yeah, and Baldy, I may have told this story. You know, my experience with Vic Fangio goes back to the Houston Texans. He was the first coordinator when Dom Capers was there. I may have said this to you. And, you know, Dom, love Dom Capers, um, who's now, I think, with Carolina as a, a upper assistant, kind of an overseer. But Vic Fangio was one of the guys that sat down with me and said, hey, here's what we're trying to do, right? And to, to and at that point, hell, he had been in the job. You know, he'd been on the job, you know, 15, 20 years or whatever it is. I think yeah. he's been in the league 31. But 
to, to kind of get into his mindset about what they were trying to do was very interesting. And then you see the stops along the way and how his defenses have been good pretty much everywhere he's been. That yeah. Texan situation, it was an expansion franchise. They had draft issues, and they didn't really have the personnel. But I think about what he was trying to accomplish. And to your point about personnel versus this is how we play or I'm going to adapt to my personnel. I think he's one of the best at that. And to your point about Denver, it didn't work as a head coach. But I also think that doesn't d- d- you know diminish – what he's done as a defensive coordinator. He's a great defensive coordinator, Baldy. You know this. But sometimes these guys get in these head coaching jobs and it just doesn't work. But then they go back to what their roots are. I think about Nathaniel Hackett with the Jets. I think he's going to be good in that role with the Jets. He didn't get a, you know, didn't do anything with, with Denver. And I understand that. But I think Vic is a similar kind of guy where you put him in this realm and you say, hey, make my defense good. He's going to do that. And Baldy, Think about all the names you just mentioned. I mean, that's a talented group. How good they're going to be, I don't know. But if you're telling me you got to stop Josh Allen, people are saying Mac Jones is going to be better with Bill O'Brien in that division. And then you're talking about Aaron Rodgers. You better be damn good on, on the defensive side of football, and specifically in the back half, because you know those guys are going to be throwing it around. There's no doubt. I mean, this. Uh, I think the AFC East is – you know, I think this thing has gotten pretty close. I mean, for, you know, obviously the Patriots owned it for a long time. Buffalo has been the successor. But I think there's this thing is going to get pretty bunched up. And I think defense, as much as we want to talk about quarterbacks, and we have to, um, defense is what's going to separate uh, this division right now. And, um, you know, Xavier Howard might have more interceptions than anybody in the league over the last five years. Yeah. Um, he did not – They they lost – the right corner and Byron Jones, they lost Nick Needham last year. They were playing rookies at the corner position, which can be tough, you know? And so now you get Jalen who wants to be here. Like Jalen wants to be here. He wants Vic Fangio as his coach. He knows he respects Vic, you know? Um, So that's good. And, you know, just for people that don't know and two different stops in San Francisco and in Chicago, Vic Fangio's defenses has led the league in takeaways. I mean, if they're up there, top three this year in takeaways, and you're giving extra bats to Mike McDaniel, to uh, Tyreek, Jalen, you're giving extra bats to this group, um, they're going to score some points. You know, they're going to put points up. And that's what they couldn't do um, over the last few years. They, they, they couldn't take the ball away, you know, with any regularity. Byron Jones just didn't intercept balls. And so Javon Holland is a pure free safety. He's an elite player. Like, you can't find a weakness on their defense. I can go to Buffalo right now. I could point out some some flaws in the defense. There might be a few flaws in the Jets' defense, in the middle of that defense. You know, I could go around, but I feel like Miami might be, you know, the best in the the AFC East. And, you know, they got to go do it. But they've got a chance to be very good. While we're talking about Miami, guys, it's in the huddle. Subscribe. You can watch this on YouTube as well at www.youtube.com slash at in the huddle pod pod we're on youtube as well guys we're putting new posts and uh snippets there as well so you can go check all this stuff out and follow us as well like us in the huddle tell your friends and subscribe so you don't miss an episode while we're talking about miami um mike mcdaniel want to get your your feel on mike mcdaniel comes from 40 from the 49ers a lot of people said oh is he ready I remember seeing the phone call, Baldy, on the plane where he's talking with Tua, and he's like, I'm going to, you know, it's my job to make you better as he's flying down to Miami. What do you think about Mike McDaniel at this point now? Is he comfortable? Do you think he's going to to be better this particular year with what he's got offensively? Not just including Tua, but I think there's a a lot of questions about Mike McDaniel and what this offense is going to look like under his tutelage. Well, a couple of things. One, I mean, even Mike – I mean, one thing about Mike is he's, he's an excellent communicator, whether it's to the media, to his players, how he communicates with his players. Like he's excellent at that. I think everybody recognizes in Miami that this is a very smart guy, but smart in a good way, smart in a good football sense. He, he would admit, though, that, you know, he's the first time he was a play caller and he's the head coach. For anybody in this business right now doing both, that's a tough assignment. You know, a lot of guys – have given it up. Sean Payton won't do that. He's excellent at doing everything. 
um, he would tell you that he's got to be better, getting the, the play in, um, having the next Rolodex of plays uh, in the next series, managing the game. Like, I think he'll be better in the second year, but it's still it's still a, a full plate when you're trying to manage the game, injuries come up, you know, you, they were playing three quarterbacks last year, uh, juggling the quarterbacks, what they, what they can do, offensive line injuries a year ago. I, I think he'll be better. But I think he's only going to be as good, Mike, uh, Carl. I think Mike's only going to be as good as his offensive line. And that's mm-hmm. the question mark on this team. I saw Teron Armstead coming back from an injury. Teron is an excellent player, but he's had, he's got an injury history. Yeah. Connor Williams is the one player not in camp. He had an excellent season as a center. I think he wants a new deal or contract. They're not going to talk about it. There's question marks about the offense line. Is Austin Jackson, can he play right tackle? He, you know, you know, you, you know, you go back, like this is, you know, this is the 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 bounty, the bounty they got when they traded Laramie Tunsil, who was an elite left tackle, still is, and I don't know that they've replaced Laramie yet. But you know, they don't have a lot of depth on that line, in my mind. They've signed some guys that have played in this league, but that's the question mark. Um, they want to like, yes, they've got ways to run the ball. Yes, they've got guys that can run it. Um, that are really good at it, you know, whether it's Mostert or Jeffrey Wilson or the rookie of Shane out of Texas A&M. They've got some speed back there, which is something Mike really covets. They don't have a real big back that I like. Um, there's talk of Dalvin Cook coming. Uh, I don't know how real any of that is. There's, It's out there in the air. Mike's not going to address that. He's under contract with the Vikings. But that's the question mark on his team. And I think Mike can only be as good a play caller as his offensive line is up front. Yeah, it's uh, that division. The guys, we're talking about it. Bills, and we'll break down as we move along through the offseason and, and learn more through OTAs and mandatory minicamp about each one of these teams. But Bills, Dolphins, Patriots, Jets. And, and I think right now, Patriots are the last team in that division. I think the Jets take a jump. And are they battling the Bills for first place in that division? You know, that's what I see right now, just based on the personnel that we know. But to your point about the Dolphins, I don't want to discount what they've got. And if Tua is as good when he's on the field as he was last year, Baldy, they're going to be a problem. That They just are. And say what you want. you got to account for that cheetah out there <laughs> and whether you're going to double team that guy or not. And it opens up so many more things. The run game to me is such a big deal, as you mentioned, because if you don't want Tua to be put in these situations, you got to be able to hand the ball off a little bit more and take some of that pressure off. That's why the Dalvin Cook thing, to your point, I don't know if that happens. I know Derrick Henry said, I'm not worried about the trade rumors. Again, I don't know if he's going to end up in Miami, but there's a couple of backs that seem to be available if teams want to make a move to go get those guys. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where anybody is with that. I understand the um, some of the metrics with paying running backs, you know, a lot of money with their with the injury history, not necessarily – you know, those particular guys you just mentioned, but just, you know, the running back position in general, uh, you know, Brees Hall can seven games could look like the rookie of the year and he's done. So, I mean, that stuff, that's just the fact. And so paying guys 10 plus million at that position is not what everybody wants to do right now. And so I don't, I don't know where that's going to be compensation, physicals, all that stuff is out there. Dalvin lives down here in South Florida. Um, I was just in a restaurant the other day. Dalvin wasn't there, but him and his brother were in there like the day before. Yeah. Like he's around and, you know, like Jalen, like it's, it's, you know, I'm looking outside right now in South Florida, Carl, it's a pretty nice place to live and to play. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, the, the income tax situation is a very affordable, let's say in South Florida. So there's a lot of attractive things about it, but I don't, I don't know where any of that stands, but look, th- the fact is they've got to run the ball better than they did a year ago. And I think if you said, okay, Mike, what to Mike McDaniel, what do you have to do better this year? He'd say, we got to run the ball better. We got to be better at it. We got to have bigger explosive runs, more explosive runs. We got to be more consistent with it. We can't just have two and drop it back and, um, you know, and throwing the ball in order to win games. So if they can run it, they can, the play action is going to be better. Two is excellent at it. He's got excellent mechanics. Um, I watched some of the, the play action yesterday. Um, you know, it's 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 elite, I believe, in how he gets rid of the ball and his accuracy and where he can put it. Baldy, let's talk about the Jets. Um, 
because we always will talk about the Jets, at least this season and maybe beyond. I mean, everybody's on it. Um, but I am concerned and, and curious to know what you think about Quentin Williams and is this contract extension going to get done? Um, Quentin Williams, 25 years old, due to make $9.6 million in the final year of his contract. It's his fifth year option. Robert Sala came out and was like, look, we're going to get this deal done before camp. How important is he to that Jets defense? And how good is he? Is he the top guy at his position in the league right now? I thought he was. Look, Aaron Donald had an off year because of the injuries that he had. But there's Chris Jones. There's Jeffrey Simmons. Like, he's he's in that conversation with Chris Jones and Jeffrey Simmons. I mean, there's Aaron Donald. When healthy, he's in a league by himself. But Quinnen was really good last year. Like, they did some things from a scheme standpoint where he got one-on-ones. And when Quinnen got one-on-ones, he won his one-on-one. Well, the 12, 12 sacks last year, right? 12. 12 and a half, but he like the way that he influenced the quarterback, you know, whether it was Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay, whether it was Joe Burrow last year, like he got to the quarterback. Josh Allen, they won a big game against Buffalo. They don't win that game without Quentin Williams. Um, and, you know, and really, if you go back and you really – studied last year's Jets teams like fourth game of the season they played the Cincinnati Bengals and at that time Robert Sala's defense coordinator they're like they're dialing up these blitzes these zero blitzes and and it, it wasn't working and Quinn Williams blew up on the sideline told basically told the coaches just get out of our way let the front four do our job let sauce and those guys do their job we don't need this we don't need like we can get to the quarterback and really the whole defense turned on that on Quinn. And I've asked Quinn about that blow up on the sideline, which was a blow up. And he said to me, look, Baldy, I don't regret what I did, but I do regret the way that I did it from a respect standpoint, like publicly how it came um, across. Yeah. Yeah. The way it came across, I was emphatic with what I believed. I did, you know, in the, in the heat of the moment, in the motion of the moment, um, I should have handled it a different way. Now he's 25 years old, like that, that happened, but it was a good thing for the team. They, um, Quinnen is the centerpiece. You, you talk about sauce. You talk about CJ Mosley. You talk about some of these young, you know, Will McDonald or Jermaine Johnson, all these number one picks. Quinn is the centerpiece. It starts there. He, he plays the game the right way, he, but you know, Quinnen, he comes out of Alabama you know, or, you know, comes out. Yeah. And, you know, he's used to winning, losing. It's hard. It's hard. <laughs> uh, it's hard. I, I, I'm trying to figure out how I couch this. Losing <laughs> six. And it wears guys down. You go home, yeah. you know, it's, it's 4 15. You just played a one o'clock game. You lost three years in a row. They've lost way more than they've won. You go home, you're on the couch and you're watching Kansas city win week in, week out. You're watching yeah. Buffalo week. And it just wears on you. And you go, it takes the fun out of it. Like That's when it becomes a job, right? That's when it becomes – and look, we know these guys make a lot of money. But to your point, when you are winning and competing and you're having fun, it's a different locker room. It's a different locker room. It's a different locker room. The fun when you're winning, when you're celebrating, when you can't wait to go to practice on Wednesday, when you can't wait to like – you know, to that – CBS number one crew coming into your locker room on Friday. Like you're the, you're the, the showcase game. Like he's never had that. You know, I mean, imagine, I mean, Chris Jones is an elite player in Kansas city, but if Kansas city wasn't winning like they are, I mean, Chris Jones, you know, I mean, he, he wouldn't be celebrated the way that he is and should be. And so that's what's missing from Quinn. But I believe, you know, if they're in there in the competing for 10, 11, 12 wins this year, playoff spots, you might see Quinn Williams go from 12 to 15 sacks, mm. you know, and quarterback hits and, you know, force fumbles and those kind of things. Like, you could see another level for him to go to. So, Baldy, in the locker room, winning is is the key. And and when you have guys with that attitude and it, it you know, just translates across the locker room, to your point about Quinnen, uh, it's, it's just a difference. And we've seen it. You see it all week, you know, all the time in the NFL. But he's not had a chance to really experience that. And I don't know what this deal is going to look like, Baldy. They're saying he's asking somewhere in between, you know, 22 and 25 million. 
Maybe they compromise and, and he gets the deal, but it's not going to be Aaron Donald money. Aaron's making about 31 a year right now, and he's still the dominant player. But I do agree that he is a guy that has to be on that defense for the Jets. Well, I, I think there's a benchmark out there. I mean, Jeffrey Simmons got paid this offseason. He's been in the league longer than Quinnen. But, you know, Jeffrey Simmons, you know, w- took down $98 million on whatever it was. I don't know the breakdown exactly. But, I mean, that's sort of like he's – I think he's a more athletic Jeffrey Simmons. Um, probably can outdo him by, I mean, if I was his agent, like here's Simmons contract, here's Quinnen's. Okay. We're going to up it a little bit, whatever. Like maybe that's gets I, the deal. The bottom line is I'm, I'm pretty sure this deal is going to get done. The jets recognize that, look, we're in it to win this thing. We've got Aaron, we've got these pieces. We got to get our offense line healthy, but we know if we're going to be, and they were top 10 defense last year. They gave up the fewest touchdowns in the league. Um, If we're going to play at the level that we want to play, Quinn has got to be in the uniform. He can't be, he can't be missing August. Like he's got to be here. And Joe Douglas understands this. Uh, I think, you know, the owner understands this, Woody Johnson, that is. So I I believe that this deal is going to get done. It might be one of these deals, honestly, Carl, that comes out of nowhere. And next thing you know, Quinn is in the house and he's signing it. I, I don't think this thing is going to be done through social media and one side. Like, I just don't think any of that's going to happen. So I think um, it's just going to be one of those deals where it's just done. And let, let's go to let's go to camp. Baldy, let's talk a little bit about what's going on with the gambling situation in the NFL. It's Carl Dukes, Brian Baldinger, guys in the huddle. Subscribe, like us, tell your friends. We certainly... We want you to be here for every episode, and we usually put episodes out on Tuesday and Thursday, depending on schedules. Baldy spent some time down in Miami with the Dolphins this week, so um, and and we'll come back, I think, Friday and and recap some of the OTA stuff. I'm going to talk with Arthur Smith today with the Falcons and talk to him a little bit about what's going on with that organization. But apparently some Colts players are being investigated for gambling. We saw Calvin Ridley get suspended for a year, and now he's back reinstated he's with the jacksonville jaguars but we're seeing more and more of this baldy where gambling is more prevalent we know that the nfl is in bed with you know some of these gambling agencies or at least you know um sports betting um you know entities but the idea for a player to say hey i'm gonna gamble on the game and baldy you know you've been around this all your life i don't understand how this continues to happen when it's pretty black and white. Now, if you're just telling me guys are going to break the rules and this is what's going to happen and the league is going to have to deal with it, okay. But if I'm a player who's making multi-millions of dollars, why the hell am I thinking about gambling on the game knowing the consequences that could come with that? And so I'm a little perplexed by it. And when I see these guys and their names pop up, I go, you idiot, you're an idiot because it makes no sense. And so I'm curious to know where you're at as a former player and then what, what guys around the league, especially in the league office, you know, are saying about this. Because this is not going away, Baldy. As a matter of fact, I think you're going to see more of it. I do too, Carl. And look, as an employee of the NFL, it's very clear to me what the rules are. And I don't in any way, Carl, like I understand we all got this device and anybody can gamble on this device. You got the Belmont coming up in New York this weekend, uh, you know, Let's put 20 bucks on a horse. Like I get, like, that's not happening to me. And I understand, it's very clear where I stand, even on certain podcasts or certain entities that want me to come on or represent, you know, a gambling house or whatever. Like I remember points yeah. Bet came after me years ago and I'm like, can't do it. Like, it's very clear. So I don't want to even go near the lines on this thing. But I do think that the players like Calvin Ridley, Okay, like that was headlines. Like this is what happens when you do this. It's headlines. Like it's got to be talked about in the hallways and in the locker rooms. And then Detroit happens. And Isaiah Rogers with the Colts happens. And I'm always throwing Isaiah Rogers out there because his name is out there right now. And he's sort of defending his position uh, in Indianapolis. But it also must be clear, Carl, that when they're sitting down and talking to these players like they do every year in training camp, and here comes the NFL security coming through or the gambling policy coming through. And you're sitting in that team meeting room 
and we're saying you can't go to a sports bet. You can't get on your device and make a wager on tonight's NBA game, like, et cetera, et cetera. Like, it must not be clear because these guys are doing it. So that's one thing. It must not be explained clearly. Now, I believe this training camp, there's going to be a huge emphasis. I mean, I don't have yes. to, like, ask the NFL, Roger or Troy Vincent or whatever, like, what we have to do differently. Um, you put a team in Las Vegas. Like, there's, you know, there's a lot of temptation there. You're a Las Vegas Raider, and you've got all those casinos right there. Okay. Teams are coming into Las Vegas night before a game, two nights before a game. There's a temptation. Um, this They've got to nip this thing right now, Carl. This can't be a headline any longer. And so whatever has to be said or done has to get said and done. And it has to get emphasized to the max. Because there's going to be punishment like it has been in Detroit, like there will be in Indianapolis. And I'm sure these investigations, it's not that hard to find you know, what, what's being said across your, your device right now. Um, but at the same time, you know, the NFL is taking a lot of money from gambling houses and, you know, I mean, the players see this and they're saying, okay, like they're seeing these advertisements on these shows constantly, nonstop. And so maybe within some of these guys' minds, it's okay. I can, you know, bet on a baseball game. And I heard this, Carl, we've got, we're making more money we know what to do with. What's wrong with putting 5000 on tonight's heat, you know, Denver game? Like, players are saying that. You're saying, yeah. wait a second. You're making more money than you ever dreamed of. Why are you putting five? Well, it's action. Like, let's have some action. Now, that's where they're at. I know. Uh, and, you know, the bigger thing for me is, to your point about putting it, put it putting a stop to it, is the integrity of the game. There's nothing okay. worse for an NFL fan to know that I'm interested in my team or my game and the integrity of that game on any given Sunday could be compromised because potential star, okay, no names, just pick a guy, is putting action on the game and somehow affecting the game. When the Calvin Ridley thing went down, you know, he wasn't playing, but he was betting on teams and things that he thought, you know, and he even talked about, you know, I did a parlay, which you're just giving your money away, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> yeah. But he talked about, you know, not playing was one of the reasons why he felt like it might be okay. Now, he also was going through some mental health stuff yeah. and some other things were happening. But I don't want to just focus on Ridley, but I think if he was playing, it would have even made it worse. And immediately what we thought about Baldy when we found out about Ridley, and we're just talking about guys, the Colts are, there's a couple of Colts players being investigated by the NFL as we speak about gambling. The thing was, did he miss a pass that he should have caught? Did he come up short on a first down that maybe he should have made? It, it gets your mind going in places, and then you start looking back at plays. And, you know, whether you think he bet on the game or not, I said this. He short arms, you know, a, a ball that he should have caught, and you go, well, should he have caught that for the first down? And it just gets you thinking about all these scenarios that could play out in a game when you have the information of a, of, of a guy betting on it. Well, I'll give you – I'll go a step further, Carl. So you can't control what a fan thinks. But fans think, because you hear it and I hear it, games are fixed. This is, this is a, like, you hear it. Now, I, you know, like, yeah. I don't respond because I'm like, okay, like, you know, the referees are, you know. But it just, they see the headlines. The fans see the headlines in Detroit, Indianapolis, Calvin, you know, Jacksonville. They, they see the headlines. And so fans think, well, this call makes no sense. It could be a call in the Super Bowl against, you know, a player. And they're like, it's it, it's like the NFL can't allow that to creep in. Where fans think this stuff is fixed. I'm just using that word. But they say that, Carl. Like, I see it. You see it. You hear it. You know? And you're like, no, it's, you, you can't do that. It's, it, it's impossible. But, like, you don't want that to seep in. Yep. to the conversation of watching these games on Sunday. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. Bart, Brian Baldinger, guys, follow him. Carl Dukes, of course, Jason Lock on four are part of this podcast as well. In the huddle, make sure you subscribe. And you can check us out on YouTube as well. We'll be posting there. And uh, make sure you follow our YouTube channel. We want to make sure that you are in the huddle with us. Baldy, uh, where are you headed next, by the way? Well, I'm, I'm here in South Florida. So I'm, I'm going to go see the Dolphins, uh, you know, one more time. And then uh, I'm heading back north. To Jersey, I got to do some stuff for the NFL, uh, NFL Network next week, doing a Baldy's Breakdown week next week on the network. And so I'm going to try to get to another team. I don't know. The Jets just canceled next week's OTAs or okay. because they, they, they're going, they're doing a Hall of Fame game. They're already going to camp a week earlier than anybody else. And they figure like they're going to get to work in then. And so that's why that was canceled. It's not because of anything else going on. Uh, you know, we'll see if the Giants or Eagles or or Washington's around. If they're in camp next week, then I'm going to go see them. All right. Well, listen, Friday, uh, I want to get into some Cowboy stuff because I've been getting a lot of a lot of fanfare from Cowboy fans about, you guys are talking about the Cowboys. I'm like, well, nothing's really going on. Yeah. But the idea that they're even entertaining maybe re-signing Zeke um, and, and Mike McCarthy in this offense, and there's a lot going on. Michael Parsons, uh, Michael Parsons said he's going to play like eight positions this year. So we'll get into some Cowboy conversation on Friday, and we've got a lot more to talk about, guys, as OTAs are going on with a bunch of teams. But uh, make sure you're here, all right? Baldy, man, have a great day. Enjoy the weather down there, and we'll talk to you. All right. Thanks, Carl. You bet. Thanks, everybody. 